In this video, I'm joined by Jim Halliburton, AKA the HMO Daddy. This video is brought to you in part by Property Summits. The first property event of its kind, Property Summits is an all-day event which brings together some of the most respected and experienced names in the property industry. To download a brochure and to find out when the next event will be held, please click the link in the description below. Hi, I'm Andy from Monopoly.com and on this channel I share my experience as a property investor and landlord and also interview other investors so we can learn from their advice too. So if you're new here, consider subscribing for more videos like this. How are you doing, Jim? So good to see you and thanks for appearing on this channel. My pleasure, Andy. Lovely for you asking me to come along and talk. It's great, it's great. I've seen you speak at a network event in Southampton, which I enjoyed, and that was a couple of years ago. So it's finally good to see you now and get the opportunity to have you on here um, and to give some advice for people that are considering getting an HMO. Before we start that, could you just tell us how you got involved? So how did you start out? Fantastic to share my experience. I started up 28 years ago, back in 1991, when I was a college lecturer and had a job. And you know what the definition of having a job is, just over broke. Yeah. Uh, but I always wanted to get into property. I'd seen the property boom, missed it. Uh, appreciated that property will go up in value again. Uh, so I thought, here I am as a college lecturer. I've got the uh, client base from the college. They were desperate for accommodation at the time. So I went and got myself an HMO. That's how I started in HMOs. In those days, it was so, so much simpler. You haven't got the regulation, but mm. you hadn't got the lending either. And there so were bedsits back then. Bedsit, well, yeah. of course, bedsits, HMOs, uh, rooms. Uh, multi-share was another. Ma another term. No, we yeah. never used it. That's the posh. That's down south, they call it <laughs> multi-share. And um, the big problem is the banks didn't lend on property back in 91. So mm. how does someone uh, get the money when they've only got a job and they're not that well off? Well, I went uh, along to uh, the lenders and got myself a whole load of credit cards. I got about 20 of them. That's why my current business cards look like credit cards. Can I, I just yeah, sure. hold one up to the camera yeah. and just say that? So I've, I've not seen a business card like that before. That is no. Good. So that's the story behind it. That's why. I, that's how I did it. I got myself 20 credit cards. In those days, you'd go into the bank and um, give me 2,000 on that one, give me 3,000 pounds on that one. You put the money in a plastic bag and you could just take it into the solicitors and give it to the solicitors and they would, um, you could buy your property with that. So it was all on credit cards. Now, Any interest-free periods? Or uh, no, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's an interesting point, I'll come back to you with, uh, on Andy, uh, that one. When I went back to my uh, college and I told people, which is I shouldn't have done, uh, that I bought an HMO, they said, well, how did you manage to do that? You inherited money? I said, no, I bought it on my credit cards. Now these, I worked in a business department, so you think people would be a bit savvy to these things, and they didn't. You said, you can't use credit cards to buy houses, therefore paying for holidays, doing your shopping with. Oh, there's some law against that, you shouldn't be able to do that. Well, I did, and I, that's how I got started. Luckily, I, and this is the, uh, you said, give some tips. There's a, a tip I think would be, you just do it. Uh, don't, you can never have enough knowledge. Uh, the more I learn about this business, the more I don't understand it. Uh, right. The people who know all about it, I've got one or two HMOs and they talk with great confidence about this will work and that's what happens. I don't, the more I do it, it just, uh, I feel there is very few rules that relate around the business. So the don't overthink it basically. Don't, don't overthink about it. If you start doing the what ifs and the what ifs, you'll never do it. It is a, a, a business full of fraught with problems and risks. I feel like Every property has got an unexploded bomb in the back garden, which will blow up over planning, housing standards, someone will sue me, neighbours complaining, whatever uh, that could happen with a property. So you just uh, get on and do it. The first property made money, and that's what got me into buying more. And in the area where I was, very few people were doing property, especially HMOs. Uh, it was un unheard of. And people said, well, it won't work. Well, I've got this property full. Then I got another one and filled that one up. And then I got another one and filled that one up. I just carried on. And the way I financed it was you buy it, the property is increased phenomenally by the, by the fact you've got rental income on it. It's not like ordinary buy-to-let properties. The great thing about HMOs 
is they can be valued on their income. Yeah. So in that, uh, my because people buy it as yeah. a up and running business, don't they? Well, I don't know if they buy it because you very rarely see them being sold. Uh, yeah. But the indication is that you're right that they they bought as a business. So if I, in my area, if I've got an income of 30 grand on the property, it'd be worth over 200, maybe two, 250,000. Yeah. Well, you could buy a house for 100 grand. So by buying the house, you then can uh, get it valued at 200K, say. Right. Lenders yeah. will lend you 70% of that, which is 140. In other words, you get all your money back out. Yeah. And that's the simple, that's why I did it. It started off just having the nerve to buy the first one, and then when banks started lending, which sort of came towards the end of the 90s, they started lending money, just carried on buying and buying. And that's how I carried on, uh, there you are. building up a portfolio. Are you happy to share how many properties yeah. you have? You... Uh, I, I don't count them. I think I've got about 140 HMOs. Right. I've got about 20, well, I've definitely got 26 single lets. I counted those up, I can manage and get about above 26. Right. But uh, yeah, it's a portfolio, it's good fun. Uh, why I keep buying, I don't. There is no why in my business. There's no exit plan. I just do it. Uh, if I can come across a deal that cashes out, in other words, I know I can buy it and get all my money back out, yeah. why don't I do it? It's a bit like finding 50 quid on the floor. If you see it there, you can pick it up. There's no risk in that. You know you're, <laughs> you're getting it for nothing. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I, I've carried on building up a portfolio. And I mean, I you must enjoy it. You obviously enjoy it. I as suppose well. I do. It's hard to say being a landlord's enjoyable. I mean, you are. And this is why I think it's important that people understand it is a business, it is work. It's a bit like being on top of Nelson's column. There's plenty of pigeons above you doing what they do. Um, and that is being a landlord. You've just got to accept that uh, you're going to be a doormat. Uh, you'll be treated with contempt by the council. Most tenants are wonderful, but there's a few who, for some reason, don't like you as a landlord. So you're going to have to learn to put up with that. But at the same time, provide a good service. Make sure you do it right. If just because you're being treated badly by the council or a tenant, you just smile and think, that bloke will be an idiot for the rest of his life. Well, with myself, uh, build up a portfolio. Though I wouldn't go for 160 or 140 properties that I've done. Keep it to about five. Five would give you a nice little income. You can do it part-time. You don't have to employ staff to do it. So you'll be able to manage a business which you give you a nice retirement, give you a bit of activity, you could manage five HMOs in less than a day. Once you've got them up and going, that is, it takes, I say, less than a day to manage those. In fact, some weeks you'll probably have no, nothing to, at all to do with it. You'd be a bit bored. So it's, it is a fun, but you've got to remember you're providing service, you're looking after tenants. Yeah. Uh, with me, I will never evict a tenant who cannot pay the rent, which is a big boast. If a tenant can't afford to pay, I'll sit down with them and work out how to do, how they can sort it out, uh, get uh, get them to claim benefits so they can pay the rent uh, if they're genuine. I get a lot of tenants who don't want to pay the rent, and we evict mm. them. So I've evicted a lot of tenants, but if they're genuine, you've got to have I think so look after your tenants. Yeah. And that I think comes back to you not all the time, but uh, you tenants are confident with you. They um, they know you'll look after them. You provide a good uh, level of service. It is an HMO, it is a room. Uh, people talk about uh, it's just living in a tiny room. Well, unfortunately for a lot of people, that's all they can afford. Yeah. You're providing a service for them. I provide full central heating, we repair the properties, and I'm proud of what I do. Yeah. And if you want to come up and see what I do, you can, because I do uh, tours, we do them about once a month, where you can come around, uh, see the properties, sit down and ask me any questions you want. I do them on a Thursday and a Saturday. So it fits up with anyone uh, who comes, whether they're free in the week or free at the weekend. I do it where I am, obviously, because you're going to go see the properties. It's a fairly yeah. small group. Uh, and we spend a whole day. And I just love talking about it, as you probably gather, because you haven't got a word in yet. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine, no. I'm more than happy for you to keep yeah. talking. So we'll put a link in the description for the details of yeah. where people can book those days to visit your HMOs, because you have a team of people that work for you, don't you? I do. Um, well, help with, manage. I've got about a 1,000 tenants. So I have about 40 staff who uh, clean, maintain, let the properties, and they do the work. So I now could step back. I'm very much in that position of, I've got a business. You know, uh, the definition of a business is you can stand out of the business. And if I go away, and the strange thing I always find is uh, my staff say the business is far better when I'm not there <laughs> than when I'm there. I, I beg to differ, uh, but 
Uh, they probably haven't got me breathing down their neck to make sure everything's going well. Uh, but we make sure that the service we provide for our tenants is good. We look after the staff, they enjoy working for me. Yeah. And uh, the tenants enjoy being with me. Property is a people business, it and is. tenants are our customers. And yes. if we don't look after them, they're just going to go, aren't they? Absolutely so right. It's in our own interest as landlords to provide that good service, mm. to make sure repairs are done quickly, yep. any issues resolved. Can we talk about something that comes up quite a bit about HMOs? Is oversaturation yes. in areas. Mm. House multiple occupations will only work in certain areas. You've mm. really got to drill down to check you're buying the right property. What advice have you got for someone that is looking at an area that thinks an HMO might work? It's a very difficult one because I just did it. I didn't check out whether it worked. I didn't look at the statistics in the area. I just bought the properties and unfortunately I you probably could say I've been very, very reckless in the way I've gone about uh, the business. I just buy a property, put it on the market, and if it lets, I buy others in the area. So that's why yeah. I've got a massive concentration where I am, because if the previous one, I have 20 in that area, and they're all reasonably full, I'll buy another one in the same area. And it took me a long time to break out of the areas and try and spread it around. So I probably well over 40 properties all within... Uh, this, a mile or two of where I am because mm. I knew they'd fill and if I started not to be able to fill them but I, I, I just don't know. As I say the people who've got the certainty in this business are the ones who've only got a few properties. I've looked at it and I've always come to the conclusion that and I say you, you've got to be careful about the area. Everything lets because yeah. I haven't bought a property that hasn't let and I've had lots of people say why do you buy a property there and I thought Oh, good point. I'm not really sure why I bought a property there. Uh, it seemed a good deal at the time, or it seemed a nice property, or it said, you know, buy me, <laughs> and yeah. I did, and it lets. I mean, the, the, the worst example of this is a lovely grade two building that was going for virtually nothing. Uh, I paid 90 grand for it, and I reckon it was worth half a million. Beautiful building. There are a lot of problems with it. It's a mile from the nearest bus stop, two miles from the nearest station, so transport links not too no, good? No transport links. Shops are not close by. It's worse than that. It's in a graveyard and they lock the gates at night. So the only way you can get to the graveyard is going through a hole in the fence. So <laughs> now that lets. Now, could you believe really? that lets very well? And it's in the middle of nowhere. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and buy an HMO in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> but that hasn't let and that's quite a freak. And people laughed at me. Uh, what are you doing buying that? What does let, definitely, is town centres. And it's not necessarily expensive. It may be in certain areas to buy in the town centre, but there's a lot of commercial buildings in the town centre, especially now with shops closing down. You can convert the flats above uh, into an HMO. You can use prior notification, permitted development, in other words, to turn the shops into residential, so you don't need planning permission. So there's a lot of opportunity now, which you didn't have. And above all, you've got the banks who are happy to fund you. Yeah. So certainly say life is easier but it has become much more regulated so you've got to know what the rules are you've got to make sure you license if you have to license because they're now out to fine you in my day very little regulation all you have to do is buy a property throw some beds in and rent it out going back when i first started i laugh at it all you had to do is i say get a uh, a property turn every room into a bedroom a kitchen and bathroom and away you went and perhaps yeah. lock uh, stick a lock on the door you couldn't get away with that today no. You would have to make sure you've got fire doors, fire alarm, and yeah. all your certificates before you start. Yeah, and, and that's possibly. depending on the area, the type of property it is. So people need to check for themselves, don't they, on the local authority websites yes. to make sure they're meeting those rules, rules and regulations. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, they've brought in Article 4 in a lot of areas, which means you can't turn a house into an HMO. Yeah. Uh, it stops it. And I say it's here, I don't have any experience of other areas, mm. so I can't really say what works in other areas or doesn't work. Mm. Uh, you, you try it. Uh, and often there is nothing to go on. I, I wouldn't say I had the first HMO in my area, but there's, uh, I hadn't heard of any others that existed where I, uh, where I was. There's small flats, and that was about it. The whole idea of having a, a shared house, even though students, most of the students in those days lived with landladies. And they didn't like that. So oh. my house filled up very quickly because they could live by themselves yeah. and have the parties and misbehave that students do. Yeah. 
Are you ready for the quick fire round? Yeah, go on. What's your favourite snack? I don't like snacks. I don't just eat, I generally eat once a day. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, I, I'm not into snacks. That's probably why I'm so thin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do eat too many snacks. Mm. I have my three square meals a day plus snacks in between, so yeah. Yeah. Oh, so one meal a day. Is that morning breakfast or? No, I just have dinner. Dinner. Yeah. Like is that That's it. dinner it, your just, lunch time or lunch? No, no, dinner, dinner, at, dinner at night. About seven or eight, seven o'clock is about the ideal time for me. Right. Don't have breakfast. Don't have lunch. Uh, unless I'm going out for a social event or something like that. Yeah. Just don't. It just sits, suits my metabolism. I know people say it's wrong, but you do what suits you. Yeah, everyone's different, aren't they? Coffee or tea? Uh, generally tea. I drink quite a lot of tea. I'll have about one, maybe two coffees a day, and that's about it. PC or Mac? Uh, Windows uh, or Mac? Neither. Do you, <laughs> no, do you no. use your phone then to uh, do everything? Or? Uh, I don't. I get my PA to do it. Um, oh, right. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, was it two years ago, I learned how to WhatsApp, and that's about as far as advanced as I got. Uh, and the year before that, I did texting. I'm not into this uh, technology. I should be, but I don't. I let it go uh, by. Last book you read? I buy, every time I go on a train journey, I go in the bookshop and buy two, because you get 50% off the price of it. So mm. I'm always buying books and rarely read any of them. When I do read a book, I just dip into it and read part of it. So uh, I'm reading Black Box, a fascinating book. It's based on the aviation industry where they very early on turned the aviation from one of the most dangerous forms of transport to one of the safest by every time they had an accident near miss they would look at it investigate it and learn from the mistake which is a great uh, philosophy yeah. which has not been followed up by any other profession uh, that they would learn from their mistakes they just particularly in a health service, they just bury their mistakes and just move on. They say they'll learn from mistakes, but they won't. Yeah. Banking is another one. Uh, so Black Box is what I'm reading. But the very best book, I think, if you want to get into property, uh, that I read, now there's lots of them do this, but it's all to do with mindset. Uh, yeah. People talk about, I need to have knowledge about property. It's not. It's your ability to take risk and your mindset and your ability to sleep at night with all the stress and problems that you have. And it's the, I think it's called The Midas Touch by Stuart Goldsmith. And it's a, mainly about mindset. That's the important thing about business. The knowledge, yes, you've got to have some knowledge, but the most important thing is your ability to do it, your uh, confidence to do this. You'll never be right to do it. There's always something you won't know, and you're always something that you're going to worry about. You just get on and do it. If you could sit down and chat to anyone for 20 minutes for some inspiration, who would it be? There's no one better than Tony Robbins. He is uh, uh, a master uh, and very much, in, again, into mindset and motivation. If you have only got a chance to go and listen to Tony Robbins speak, see his videos, yeah, uh, he's phenomenal. You hit the right thing, it's all to do with your head. It's your belief. The knowledge is really minor to it. You'll pick that up. If you're motivated to learn, you'll learn very, very fast, but you've got to have the confidence to go ahead and do these things. To wrap up, Jim, what advice would you have for someone who's considering investing in property, but has yet to take that first move, who's maybe having doubts, what would you say to them to help get them started? Just do it. That's the, the answer. Get on and do it. In time will never be right. Prices have always gone up, but they'll go up later on. It's the question is, do it, ask questions, uh, learn as much as you can about the business, but just get on and do it. Don't overthink it. Don't yeah. wait for the lights to be green because it will never happen. Yeah. Just take that first step and do it. That's great, Jim. Thanks ever so much for your time. Pleasure. I really appreciate take care. that. If you found this video useful, please like and share and definitely subscribe so you won't miss any of my future videos, which will all be geared towards helping you start and improve your property business. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.